three Hornets make it on a top 100 list. We'll talk about the core of this team, then go down to Greensboro. DJ Baker, new G League head coach, held press availability. His introductory press conference yesterday. We have Sam Purley of Hornets.com to talk all about it. That's all today on Locked on Hornets. You are Locked on Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, because we live. It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Pat. Uh, bo- goodness gracious, Podcast Network. I've done the that what? a million times. The what? The what? Doug. I think oh that's boy. the first you mess up in the intro. That debate or what? I mean, I, I was, but the intro. <laughs> I don't know if I've messed up, but we got to change the calendar. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't messed up on the intro in like years. It feels like. Oh, we got to change it. Oh no, part of the Locked On Podcast Locked on Network. Sporting, sporting. Oh no, it's your team every day. I'm sorry, David. <laughs> I'm sorry, David Locke. I'm sorry, our fearless leader. You can still check us out and make us your first listen wherever you catch your podcast. You can also get us on YouTube as well. And there's Doug Branson, who has one other comment about my mishap. You can find his rights and his rights ups on everyhornetsboxscore.com. <laughs> well, here's here's what I'm thinking. That I, I love this mm. for you, Walker, because... This podcast exists. I don't know if people know the sort of behind the scenes production of this whole thing, but we mm. record this thing at what eight thirty, typically eight eight thirty Eastern time, sometimes nine Eastern time. But it's but but importantly, it's before your radio show. Yeah, and I love this for you because it's like a warm up. This show is like a warm up. It's like a chance for you to stretch. Uh, your your radio muscles, and then you go into the Wes and Walker show, primed up, ready to go. I'm your I'm your uh, I'm your radio production fluffer i get you ready wow i wish you would have used a different term there but that's okay um i will say that you, you know, in the introduction we could have just like oh we'll just do it over again but no that's not what we're doing we're, we're giving the people all of the mishaps all of the blunders and all that good stuff i get you, you gassed can, up yeah you can listen to me on wfnz hopefully not messing up as frequently as i just did there in the intro WFNZ 92.7 FM, Wesson Walker 12 to 3. Oh, yeah, I got a sponsor to get to as well. This episode is brought to you by Game Time. <laughs> game, time? game Time? Thanks to Game Time. <laughs> Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Okay, top 100. This will go a lot better, I promise you. We have three players on the Hornets roster that were featured in a Hoops Hype article, Doug, a part of the top 100 list in the NBA. And LaMelo Ball, Brandon Miller, Miles Bridges are the three names featured. No surprise here, really, Doug. You can tell the people where they rank, but I feel like, for the most part, where they're ranked, the names that are featured on this top 100 list, it feels like Hoops Hype, you know, maybe got it right with these guys, with the exception of LaMelo, because we have no clue where to put LaMelo when healthy. Is he hurt? Sam Vecini said the same on his podcast about a month ago. Yeah, so this uh, was done by Frank Urbina and uh, Raul Barragan from Hoops Hype, top 100 players in the NBA for 24-25. And I don't know about you, Walker, but to me, the transition between NBA offseason into NBA preseason is the top 100 list coming out. Uh, From Hoops Hype, from ESPN, that is truly the marker that we have entered a new era of of the season, which is preseason. So it really is the ESPN one for me because it's it's such like a grand reveal. They'll go from a hundred to eighty and then seventy nine oh, to fifty. Yeah. They like they they and they give it out in certain days and they make you wait for it. And of course, you know, we're gonna have NBA shows. They're gonna talk about like every fifth of the list that's released. Yeah. And they're gonna spend a couple days on it. It's great stuff. No, it is. You walk outside in the morning and the air is a little crisper. The leaves are starting to change colors and folks are telling you who the top 100 players in the NBA are. It is truly a marker of preseason. It's sad for me, honestly, because, you know, summer is for feelings. It's where I can get all into my feelings about how players are going to be, what they're going to do, what they were. And now preseason is for reason. We have to settle down. We have to temper our expectations and get back into reality. And the reality is that the Hornets 
uh, according to Frank and Raul here, have three players in the top 100. Miles Bridges coming in at number 67. And then Brandon Miller, the sophomore, coming in at 58. And finally, rounding it out, is LaMelo Ball, top 50 player, but just barely. He's number 41. Yeah, so, okay. And and, and so, almost even top 40 player. With LaMelo, top 30 almost. means you're an all-star, right? Like, when you're top 30, that's basically you're an all-star. You're given the benefit of the doubt on being an all-star, even if, you know, the whole East-West thing, we know the divide there. I, like, I understand LaMelo having not reached the All-Star game the last couple of seasons. It is largely because of injury. If we were to, you know, put him even further up, I would understand that given the type of impact he certainly has on a team's offense. But I, I'm like, I can only get so mad at these publications putting LaMelo outside of the All-Star top 30 list because we just haven't seen him a whole lot. Brandon Miller, like I, I think that's a lot of respect for someone that's coming into their second year. And I wonder how many people would flip Miles Bridges and Brandon Miller right now, Doug. Like I think that's an interesting conversation because how much of this is based off of what you think Brandon will do for the future, what you think Miles is right now, what you think Miles will give you as a part of the future. Like I, I think the Brandon Miles thing, there would be Hornets fans that might swap those based on the here and now. Mm -hmm. But I have no problem with this list. Maybe it's because I myself know what it's like to create a list and get criticized, and I will not do that. I will not become a part of the problem. No, I mean, I think you he settles right into an area full of players that have either have been great and are sort of fading, which is not where LaMelo is, but he's also in a group of players like Brandon Ingram who have shown flashes of greatness but have also been limited by injuries. You know, I think there are a few players below LaMelo that have a case that maybe they should be a little bit higher, like Franz Wagner uh, and <laughs> the great Derek White, great Olympian Derek White. Uh, but I think LaMelo settles right in. And they even mention in this article that he's tricky to rank. In terms of Brandon Miller, I think he's perfect too because you've got to see the follow-up. Like, rookie, great rookie season. LaMelo had a great rookie season, and then he came in and followed that up with uh, the beginnings of the, the All-Star campaign. And so – you know, you've got to see the follow-up before you can really get serious about ranking him as a top 50 player, but he's already knocking on the door, and that just, you know, goes to show you, like, what he showed off, even despite, you know, coming in third in the rookie rankings. Uh, he showed off so many flashes of, hey, this guy can be great. Three-level score, potential on defense, you know, all kinds of things like that. So I'm, I'm cool with that. And I love that this ranking, too, flashed the, uh, the salaries and told you where they rank salary-wise. For LaMelo, he comes in 41 on the list, and it's $35 million that he's due next season, or this this coming season, which is the first of his max deal. That ranks 36th overall in salary, so pretty close, 41, 36. And then, of course, you know Brandon Miller being on the rookie deal, he's 58, and I think he's like 146th in salary, but that's rookie deal. And then if I go to uh, Miles Bridges, who is 60, scrolling, 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 67, He's going to earn $27.1 million, and that's 58th overall in salary. So, again, not, not a huge difference there. I mean, if, if you're just yeah. basing this you know, off this list, then it's a slight overpay, but it's pretty in line with, with where he is rank-wise. Well, and, and remember, it's a descending contract, right? So e even if yeah. you wanted to average it out to the 25 that it comes out to, then maybe the 25 million annually with it being a little more front Probably get some little closer, yeah. That's right. Yeah, you, you might even, I mean, damn, I'm not going to do the math. I've already messed up English today. But if Let's you were to I, do I'll the math. I'll try to find a $25 million player and see yeah. where that comes in. I, I did think the, the, the split between Brandon's ranking and Miles it w was interesting here, though. And I, again, I don't have any real issues with it I, I do think I don't I don't think there's any other Hornet that should be on the list right like Mark Williams has some upside as a center that you can depend on but he hasn't been healthy he's still young I'm fine with him being outside the top 100 if this would have been the team before the deadline then maybe you could have gone I don't know Terry Rozier in the top 100 list you could have gone with one of the vets before they were traded but other than that like th this is it, it's a good young core, right? Like Miles coming back, even when we've talked about his contract and whether we agree with it or not, we do think at least the value, much like Hoops Hype indicates here, the value is pretty fair given the level of player that he is. 
and it's still going down and it gives you room to have Brandon and LaMelo be the two headed monster that we all expect them to be like. So it again, it, it goes to speak to just how much in line we are with the front office and for the most part, just knocking out of the park with every single decision that they've made. So Jaron Jackson Jr. of the Grizzlies makes $25.2 million, so pretty close, and he's 64th overall in salary. So that's just just a couple spots off. So, yeah, that's pretty remarkable that all yeah. of these salaries, generally, they, they align with. <laughs> what are they? Well, are they thinking about this stuff? Are they, uh, they yeah, this stuff you know, out? we might have just fell right into their trap. We got baited, you might say. We might have just fell right into their trap. I think that might have just happened. All right, coming up next on the Locked on Hornets podcast. Let's welcome Sam Purley of Hornets.com. We'll bring him in to talk about DJ Baker's press conference, your new Greensboro Swarm G League head coach. And then we'll get to some of his other articles that he's written a part of Hornets.com in the past, the recent history of some of those pieces. That's coming up next on Locked on Hornets. Before we get to Sam, I want to tell you that this episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time? Game time has a new feature. Oh, come on, David Walker. What are you going to be late on this, Doug? Come oh, sorry. On, no, well, I was Goodness trying to get the gracious. graphic up. You know, listen, I've got a lot of responsibilities on this show. You know, it's a, I'm not just a pretty face and a nice voice. I'm trying to get Sam ready. I'm mm-hmm. trying to get the graphic ready. And you're, you're talking to me about calling me David Walker. Listen. Yeah. So, sorry, David, for the stray, by the way. That just came naturally. Game time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. That's the second time somebody has said fluff on this show, by the way. Game Time, we appreciate their sponsorship. We appreciate them helping out with the podcast network. They have Game Time Picks, but they also give you seat views, the lowest price guarantee, or Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Game Time ticket coverage, it's your purchase being covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account use code locked on nba for twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-n-b-a locked on nba for twenty dollars off download game time today what time is it game time game time nice job more locked on hornets ahead Big thanks to Sam Purley joining us here on Locked On Hornets. Sam Purley of Hornets.com. You can find all the stuff that he writes there, Hornets.com. Also on his Twitter handle, you can follow him on Twitter. I believe I have this correct, at Sam underscore Purley. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I don't even need I don't even need to look at it. I just know it by heart. That's how you know you're in the business, man. Sam, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Thank you We're- for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. We appreciate it. You were down in Greensboro yesterday for DJ Baker, the new Greensboro Swarm head coach, introductory press conference. What were some of your takeaways from the new Swarm head coach and uh, some of the things that you plan on possibly writing about? Yeah, it was uh, you know really good to uh, learn more about him. Uh, I'll be completely honest; I was a little unfamiliar, at least when we hired him and, and when we did, um, you know, just kind of doing the background story and. Um, learning of the stops he's been at and the players he's worked with. And, uh, I mean, he's got quite a, a resume in terms of, of places he's been. You know, he's been in, I think, four or five different NBA organizations, worked with a lot of big-time players, um, you know, a lot of, of good coaches, Rick Carlisle, Dwayne Casey, um, Nick Nurse, I believe, or maybe overlapped or didn't overlap in Toronto necessarily. But, uh, man, he is fired up for this job. I mean, he's really, really fired up. Uh, he said, you know, he really loved the G League. He was the, the Pistons G League affiliate, um, Motor City Cruise head coach, I think, two years ago. They made the playoffs the first year. And I think they finished at uh, 39 and 25. So he's worked in a wide array of player development, assistant coach, scouting coordinator, uh, has a little bit of college experience well, was with the Bucks this past year. So um, you, you can really – the thing I, I took away from the most, you can tell – one, how really excited he is for the job. I think that coming with new ownership, new head coach, new front office, like just kind of everybody coming together all at once, uh, he said was a really, really, you know, unique and, and opportunity that he was excited about to have everybody, everything kind of, you know, everybody on the same page, starting together new and, and working towards one common goal. But you can really tell how 
excited he is to work with guys in the G League and help them reach the next step of their careers. You know, whether it's, you know, undrafted rookie or it's a guy on an assignment or two-way guy or a veteran that's been in the league trying to get back or trying to get a contract overseas. I mean, it's a really hard job being a G League head coach. There's a lot of, um, you know, guys coming and going, guys – you know, making sure everyone's kind of still playing team oriented basketball and, you know, with everyone kind of make sure that's the common goal while everyone else is also, you know, trying to get to the NBA as well. So uh, you got a guy with experience, a guy that is super fired up to be there and, and a guy that um, is really excited to be on the same page with, you know, all the recent additions and, and Jeff, uh, Jeff Peterson and Charles Lee and new ownership too. So uh, that's, that's what I took away is this guy seems really, really fired up for this job. And uh, you know, that's obviously what you want to see in here. Yeah. One of the things that I kept hearing over and over in that press conference was alignment that they were really focused on finding someone uh, that, you know, wanted to run the playbook that the Hornets were running, they wanted to, you know, have have the same kind of ideas about player development. Is that something you picked up on? And what does that say about, you know, generally how this franchise is operated as they've been transitioning into the the you know new era of ownership, new you know new uh, executive vice president of basketball operations as they've introduced all of these new people, getting everyone on the same page. I mean, that that seemed to be a focus uh, in the press conference. Yeah, the alignment thing is definitely. I think that's kind of the, the common goal of of the G, of every G League franchise and its NBA team. You want when guys go up and down to be very seamless. The plays calls are very similar. Their role is mostly the same. Um, you know, and, you're, and it's not even 10, 15 years ago. You know, when not every NBA team had a G League team, you would assign guys to Sioux Falls and, and Oklahoma City, and you just kind of want them to go out there and, and just and just play, but there wasn't reps. as much. Yeah, there wasn't exactly as much control in terms of what you were doing and things like that. So uh, I thought it was interesting. I think he said this on Sam Barber's podcast the other day that uh, when the schedule came out, they've already started looking at, you know, breaks in the schedule or timing of when, you know, specifically looking at the two-way guys, when you can send them up and down, when they're going to have breaks and things like that, or stretches where they can go to Greensboro for a couple days or, um, you know, Obviously, you know, last year, I think you know, obviously the year before, you know, the, the injuries, you know, hurt the Hornets so much that a lot of those guys that you needed in Greensboro or you planned to be in Greensboro, I think Nick Smith kind of being one of the more obvious examples last year. I mean, he had to play with the Hornets a lot more than I think people or at least the front office was, was expecting just because of the injuries too. So um, not that it's necessarily a bad thing or anything like that, but you saw – you know, how much it benefited Mark Williams two years ago as well, that mm-hmm. first half of that season, getting those reps in the G League. And he came up and, and just hit the ground running. And then when Mason Plumley got traded, I mean, it was it was awesome. And the defense was really, really good, especially after the All-Star break two years ago. So, um, yeah, the alignment is definitely a, a really important thing. And uh, just everybody being on the same page. And you just want to make those trips um, to Greensboro and back just as seamless and as comfortable as possible for – you know, two way guys or, or younger guys kind of going down there on assignment. Yeah, I know. And I think it's super important just to the overall like functionality of the organization. Cause I think a lot of people here, new G League coach and people in Greensboro, I think will be excited about it. I think it's, it's harder to sell that to fans that are just excited to see the Hornets play, but it actually, it's a big deal because you, you mentioned Mark Williams there. If Mark Williams goes down to Greensboro and has a bad experience, feels like everybody's not on the same page that he's not getting better as a player. You know, young guys talk to other young guys, and then other young guys are going to be less, you know, willing or less, uh, you know, thrilled about going to Greensboro and developing there. Um, and so, you know, it all sort of like folds down. If you're if you're functional in in one area, you know, it's you're more likely to be functional in all areas. So I think it's it's super important to get this 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 hire and all these hires right. Absolutely, and I think the it was brought up yesterday, and I think it's gotten better over the years that the the stigma of the G League has. Um, it's not what it once was. You know, it's it's is not a, a punishment or a guy is underperforming and he needs to go down to the G League and you're never going to see him again. I mean, somebody's, they go down for a day sometimes and come back after playing one game. And it's, you know, I I asked, um, I think it was Jeff Peterson yesterday, you know, about KJ Simpson and Musa Diabate, the two-way guys under contract right now. He said they're super fired up to play in the G league. They want to play, they want reps. They know that that is part of their developmental process and you're not necessarily going to, 
you know, you can get better in practice and things like that. But I think if you ask these guys are hyper competitive as already, and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, would you rather go down to the G league and and play 35 minutes and and take, you know, get 15, 20 shots and and be able to have the ball in your hands all the times or, you know, kind of the the opposite. And obviously I think, you know, the, the perception in the league right now is younger players know that the G league is, you know, a path to getting more playing time in the NBA and, and getting those reps. And um, I think Cole Teal, the, the swarm general manager brought up yesterday that it's either at 50% or now over 50% of um, players in the NBA on opening night lineups last year had some sort of G league experience. So um, it's, it's, I think it's definitely being used and viewed more so as a, as a tool and a resource and not a, a, a banishment and a punishment and a guy's done something wrong. It's, it's, you know, it's an extension of practice and it's an extension of, you know, regular game reps. Well, and, and one thing I like when the Hornets move on to different head coaches, it usually when you just move on and you have so much turnover, a lot of times teams can overcorrect where everything, let's just throw it all out. When no, nah, we can, there was some good stuff that we can keep going along here. When James Borrego was hired as head coach, he talked about using Greensboro a lot and they discussed using the G League as a source of development. And I remember you used the term players thinking about it as a punishment. Man, our guy, Dwayne Bacon, all he loved to do was hoop, baby. Just give him a damn basketball. And he was a happy guy. And he didn't care if he had to go down to the G League or come up to the main roster. Devontae Graham talked about that a little bit. Like, look, we can't discuss this as a punishment. So I kind of I like the idea of Borrego ushering that mindset in along with decision makers higher up, the players buying into it. And I also think with there being so much fluidity, two-way contracts, you can get immediate gratification by getting called up to the big league roster within the same damn day. Like we used to have a promo here, Doug. I don't know if you remember the promo of where it's like, we're going back to Greensboro. We're going back to Queen city, you know, <laughs> snip, snap, snip, snap. Like it's it, it the, the fluidity knowing I might be here in Greensboro, but I'll be up in Charlotte in no time. I think that also allows players to buy in is what you're discussing. So it's really cool to see all of that. One last question on this before we finish the Hornets grid, try to finish it. Um, Tijon Salon not mentioned there. Like, do you expect Salon to go to the Greensboro Swarm at all this year? Sam, Musa Diabate, KJ Simpson, they were mentioned by Jeff Peterson, but no Salon. Is there anything to read into that, or was it just like, hey, who knows? I know these two guys are going to be here. I'm not sure about the sixth overall pick. Yeah, not necessarily. I think it just kind of said, you know, being a two-way guy with KJ and Musa, you know that they're going to spend the majority of the the season. Well, not I shouldn't say majority, but the, you know, two way guys in the past tend to spend a good chunk of time in the G League. I think last year and the year before being an exception with the Hornets, just because the injuries, you just didn't have the that flexibility at all. I mean, they were, you know, needed centers and signing guys and then releasing them and and you know, kind of a, a lot of different guys had that two way contract last year. So I think it's certainly a possibility, but. Um, you know, I think right now when you look at your roster and filling out the rest of the G League roster down there, you know, you want to put guys together that are going to complement each other. They're going to bring the right veteran leadership skill set. And, um, you know, it's not an easy job, especially GM, head coach, um, Cole Teal, DJ, you know, Jeff as well. That You know, it's not an easy job putting together a G League team and making sure everybody is on the same page, too. So uh, would I be surprised if Tijon Salon spent some time in the G League this year? Not at all. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, something that's so set in stone that as soon as the season starts, he's going to go down there and you're not going to see him again yeah. this year. And it's going to be a, a red shirt season of any sorts. I mean, they're going to put him in the best chance of best position to be successful long term. I think that's that's kind of the um, understanding with Tijon. Again, he's, you know, a, a really, really enticing, exciting prospect. You saw those flashes at Summer League, but he has played just I think one season of of LNBA pro ball in France um so you know whatever is going to be best for him they're going to do it but I think right now as you kind of look at KJ you look at Musa they're a little bit older than Tijan as well those are two guys you can kind of at least pencil in and sort of build around down in Greensboro that we could envision a scenario that if everything goes right and the team at Chelsea that those guys will be there for uh, a good portion of the season. Yeah, that's that's what I was laughing about when you when you first said that because like it would be a refreshing change of pace if the two-way guys spent a majority of the season in Greensboro instead of being on a triage unit 
um, in Charlotte. That would be that. That's ideal. Yeah, that would be that would be very ideal. It means we're healthy, which which was not the case the last couple of years. I would like to be healthy at the very least. Please, oh, I won't ask him anything. I asked something for the Panthers. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah, ask yeah, anything. Shut up! Don't I'm say sorry. anything. I'm sorry. Take Knock it back. Woods. Oh my I'm, god! I'm, I'm sorry. I'm what are you sorry. doing? All right, let's move on. Coming up next, locked on Hornets. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We'll continue to finish the Hornets grid. We're close. We'll get some help from David Walker, but we'll also get some help in the next segment from Sam Purley on the most athletic Hornet of all time. Stick around and find out who we decide that is. Coming up next, LOH. This episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. It's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. More Lockdown Hornets ahead. There it is in all its glory for those watching on YouTube. It is the Hornets grid where we have a bunch of different players featured in different boxes. We did not use any of the hater picks for Sam. We would not do that to the esteemed Sam Purley. Um, man, that wreath is beautiful too surrounding MKG. But we have a couple of other boxes to fill. Most underrated, most overrated. And the one we're going to fill today, most athletic. Uh, Sam, we thought you would be a perfect guy to bring on because you are a Hornets historian. You are the master of hoops grid. You are consistently in the 99th percentile. We figured you would be able to know exactly who is the most athletic Hornet slash Bobcat of all time, given your knowledge of the game. So who are some names that immediate, immediately come to mind that need to be in consideration for us to discuss? So when I listened to the podcast yesterday, I knew – uh, you kind of gave me a little bit of a warning. Yep. It's almost like I, you were going to call me out if I didn't catch, catch me off guard <laughs> if I didn't listen. So, uh, you know, dropping an Easter egg in there. But the, the I wrote down a handful of names. A few of them were um, from prior to when I was with the Hornets. And then I wrote down a handful that, like, if someone were to ask me, like, the most athletic guys you've seen in Charlotte since I started working for the team, which was okay. – um, start of the 2014 so the big three that come off the bat and this is kind of in a, a past era were larry johnson baron davis and gerald wallace um and instantly i was thinking you know dunk contest because those yeah. are obviously going to be the most uh kind of athletic guys so those were the three sort of in the pre me working for the team era that instantly came to mind and then I had a handful of, uh, of guys that really stood out from when I was here that you would see in practice every once in a while, you know, throw the ball off the side of the gym and, and do something crazy. And you're like, wow, like, I didn't even know that you could do something like that. So uh, the ones that came to mind right away, Malik Monk, mm -hmm. Miles Bridges, Dennis Smith, Kai Jones, and... Um, kind of a sneaky one, but really had a, some bounce was Jeremy Lamb, too. Um, so those were the five that really, just off the top of my head from the eight, eight nine, ten years that I've been here, if someone said, if you were going to build an all-athletic starting five, those would be the five that came to mind. Doug, what do you think? The Dennis Smith Jr. one stood out. I'm like, yeah, you know, thinking about it, yes, he could yam it hard. We didn't see a ton of that because we caught him kind of more on the tail end of that of that beautiful athleticism that well, he had. Well, remember we but caught his layup package early, and then he warmed up at the end of the season where he was dunking on people. That's well, when we yeah, got to well, I was going to say, towards the end of the season in that Dallas game, he buried them with, a, with yeah. a monster jam. So, yeah, Dennis Smith Jr. definitely there. I think he got all the names right. The thing that I was thinking with Larry is, like, with LJ, do we give him a little bit more credit because he was doing things outside of what we think a guy in that sort of body type could do? Uh, or or are we you know properly rating his athleticism? Now, that would be the question I have about LJ. But all the other all the other guys you mentioned are sort of what we would think as like you know t doing things typical to their body size athletically. 
Well, yeah, like for me, it, yeah, trying to measure athleticism, right? Is it <clears throat> is it only bounce because it most people go to the dunk contest? No. You you have to go there, right? That that's where you start. I totally agree. So now, are we excluding, uh, for instance, MKG? MKG wasn't dunking on a lot of dudes, but my God, you couldn't get past them. Part length, part motor, but also you have to be crazy athletic to stay in front of the best athletes in all of sports. And so MKG, in my opinion, should get some love, even if he's not dunking on guys like that and can rise above the gym. Um, you know, Miles Bridges is one where I don't know how laterally quick he is or just beating you off the bounce. But he's probably the best in-game dunker in Hornets history. Consistently, power, athleticism. I, I don't know anybody that would beat him. Like, with all due respect to LJ, who's up there, Baron Davis, Miles is still probably that guy through the first three, four years of his career. So it, it's just a matter of, right, Doug, like, how do you measure athleticism enough? And then how do you feel good enough about how you measure it to put the guy in the box? Yeah, see, I don't think it's just about dunking. I don't think it's just yeah. about balance. I think it's it's endurance. It's it's uh, also quickness, as you mentioned, the lateral quickness aspect to it. Um, I, I, think it I think it is about dunking. It is about bounce. Um, and, yeah, I, I think there are all of these things that you can kind of calculate into the – athleticism it's it's using your body uh to get an advantage over an opponent and and i think you know all of the players that we've mentioned so far we did but in the dunking category we got to mention uh jay rich uh, jason richardson who uh nada mentioned in an earlier episode too you got to throw his name in the hat as well what do you think sam what what, what where, where if you had to dwindle this thing down to like three or you know start to shorten the list up a little bit who are the names that you think should survive each stage of this conversation I'm kicking myself because I should remember Jason Richardson too. Um, it's it's interesting you bring this up because it's something that like I've kind of written down as a potential story this year. Of, like, how do you measure athleticism? And it's I think it's easy as I just did. You you th instantly think of just dunk contest and you know commercials and things like that. So uh, real quick, the two other names that kind of came to mind. I was quickly glancing up some past rosters. Gerald Henderson uh, could get up a little bit. Yeah, he did. And, uh, yeah maybe more so earlier in his career, although you could still see flashes of it towards the end when it was with the Hornets. He had some moments, was was Marvin Williams too, at Carolina and then with it at Atlanta especially, and then his game sort of changed a little bit. But he had some moments with the Hornets. I think he I remember dunking on, on Bismarck Biombo uh, when he was on the Magic, you know, in his – 12, 13, 14 seasons, you're like, oh, yeah, he well, still got it. So. Well, he still had it, but I remember a, a baseline uh, drive dunk that he had where he came down and I was worried for him because I felt like he got a, you know, he was a little bit older and he, but he remembered what it was like to do the things that he did when he was younger and he tried it. And I was a little concerned as he fell back to earth, like, oh God, oh, oh boy, what have I done? What have I done? Well, he was good for a top 10 play like two, three times a year for the yeah. last four years of his career. He would be featured um, when he would get a full head of steam. Somebody thought they could try him and then they would be sadly mistaken. I'm going to throw out an underrated name here too. I'm going to get made fun of, but I'm actually going to go throw two out. And yes, it is going to be the sneaky athleticism, the white guy who can get up seven feet of smooth just for the one play alone on LaMarcus Aldridge. But really, I'm I'm kidding about that one. But I'm only, I'm only halfway kidding about Cody Zeller. Remember Cody Zeller's combine? Like, as a seven-footer, his measurables compared to other seven footers were really good. Like his vertical was something crazy. He actually had like some really impressive combine testing. I'm not putting him in the box here. I'm just saying just an honorable mention, maybe outside the top 10, but like he, he's just outside. He, he's looking in the window. All right. So I, yeah, go ahead, Sam. I said, I, I kind of uh, avoided the question. I think if I had to really narrow it down, uh, I would go, to some finalists, I would say Larry Johnson, Gerald Wallace, and either Miles or Jason Richardson would kind of be the four that would really kind of, uh, you know, stand apart in terms of athleticism and, and doing stuff in games that you were like, okay, wow, like this is, this is different. Um, and I think, like you said, Doug, you got to, you got to factor body size in a little bit. You yeah. know, what Larry was doing was different. What, you know, Baron being, as, you know, as small as he was with playing at the rim, you know, as much as he was, you know, it's, 
it's a, it's not the easiest um, attribute to, to quantify, uh, but those would kind of be the four um, that I think would stand as part for me. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we've we've got a couple of Bobcats on here, and I filled in some boxes, by the way, that we haven't we've been discussing along the way. We haven't made it official, but I put Al Jefferson in best in post. I put oh, uh, yeah, I put Gerald did. Wallace in best perimeter defender. Totally, but I, you know, I I think that with all due respect to Larry Johnson, I think when we had that discussion about athleticism and all of the different things that it means, and I think there's one guy that we've talked about that checked literally every single one of those boxes. And it's Gerald Wallace. I think Gerald Wallace is the most athletic Hornet Bobcat uh, that we've that we've witnessed. And I think Larry Johnson did some things that were he, – he looked athletic for his size. But I think just in terms of pure athleticism, Gerald Wallace is the guy. Any, any, any disagreements there? Yeah, no. I, I'm fine with it. You're right. Dunk contest. You know, and also, like, part of me feels like, you know – you got to put it to use in a way that makes you a good basketball player to be. I mean, because Kai Jones might be the answer, right? Kai, just just a freak size. You know, he wasn't crazy skinny. He was like athletic, even laterally to a certain extent. You yeah. know, maybe the understanding of what to do on the court is what you would question. But just as far as like real freaks, Kai might be here. Some of the best in game dunks we've seen. Part of me like feels the need to give this to a player that was good, uh, you, you know, like yeah. w- w- one of the better players. It, and that's why I, I like Gerald Wallace, because you're right. I don't know if there's a box that he doesn't necessarily check off. And uh, like all defense, you know, one of the only guys ever to have two blocks and two steals in a season he's like one of four players ever to register that kind of season it's ridiculous man so i'm fine with going with a guy like crap well sam uh, gets the final call he's the guest right. sam what do you think gerald wallace most athletic i'll go with gerald wallace too and while i was just at the same point the i you know you think about the dunking and the athleticism but like he was such a good defender and, and the shot blocking too i mean you've got to be really athletic it wasn't a a seven foot two defender up against the basket bl- blocking everything that came his way the steals the you know, how quick he got up and down the court. I mean, he, he also had longevity, too. I mean, he was really one of the most, you know, he did it for, you know, dating back to his Kings days all the way to 2010. I mean, it's talking eight or nine years of high-level athleticism in his game. So I will, I, you've, I think, in my opinion, I think we, we have a winner. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, wait, real quickly, chances that Tijon Salon gets into that box at some point in this Hornets career? Hmm. Oh, I think it's, it's a, obviously yes. I think he's he's super athletic and, uh, um, yeah. Maybe when you're circling back next year, I don't know if this is like a every five years or this is going to be an every year kind of thing. <laughs> every but, single we're gonna do it every single year. Well, in fact, twice different a year. categories could be different categories <laughs> next year, but uh, for sure, I think he could he could definitely be in a you know a handful of these these categories. Our candidate at least. Okay, right. Tijan Salon, we'll talk We'll talk about you next year, my man. Thanks again to Sam Purley for helping us out here on Lockdown Hornets. Find his work on Hornets.com and his Twitter handle where he's always tweeting out interesting Hornets nuggets, by the way, at Sam underscore Purley. There's Doug. Find him on his sub stack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. And I'm Walker Mail. Listen to me, WFNZ, every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. on Wes and Walker. Have a great rest of your day. I think we plan to finish the Hornets grid tomorrow with David Walker. You won't want to miss it.